So it is my great pleasure to introduce Jeannie Rosier-Smith as our demonstration artist tonight. Um, we had Jeannie do a demonstration for us back in 2013. And I had remembered that as one of the best demos I've seen. And so I started talking to Jeannie about two years ago about coming back and doing another demo. And um, <clears throat> we were started to talk about dates and whatever. And, and I said, and also, um, I'd like to take your classes. <laughs> I, I'm an oil painter. You know, I've been studying oil painting for a while. But I just wanted to do that. And I had dabbled a little bit in pastels back in the 80s with some really terrible Rembrandts um, at the time. Um, but I thought it might be fun to get back into pastels. And once, um, and I was lucky that she had like one spot left for the Tuesday morning class. And I grabbed it. And I got to take her classes for about a year and a half before she had to sadly give up the the Tuesday classes. But what I want to tell you about Jeannie, I mean, you've, some of you know her, and if you don't know her, you've probably read about her and all her awards and getting in the magazines and that sort of thing. But what you really need to know is she's a fabulous, fabulous teacher. And um, I have been the beneficiary of that. And um, even though she's not teaching the Tuesday classes anymore, she does do workshops, and um, I do encourage you to sign up for her email list because if you get uh, the emails from her, you'll find out what workshops she's doing and where she is, and also she sends out some blogs sometimes with some good information. Um, so um, I think you're in for a real treat tonight, <coughs> and uh, without further ado, I introduce Jean Rosier-Smith. I should have talked to Bobby about managing your expectations. <laughs> With that opening now, I think I'm afraid you're really going to be expecting a lot. Can you turn on um, the mic? Yes, I will turn on the mic. There. Can you hear me? Does, yeah, is it working? Yeah. Great. Uh, the gentleman that gave me the uh, this, <coughs> sir. Excuse me. I just want to make sure. Can you? Is this working for you? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, before I forget, I want to mention, and this is probably just a bribe so that you will leave happy, but I brought with me a stack of my calendars because for this year. Everybody gets to take one with you. Um, that's because um, I typically have calendars printed up and, and uh, sell them on my website, and this year I wasn't real happy the first time I got the printed copies of them. I thought they were just a little bit dark, so I, but I, they were still nice. I just wrote to the printers and I said, they seem a little bit dark. Is there, did I do something wrong? So just for next time, can they be better? And they sent me a new hundred copies of them. So I had this extra set of 100. So I ended up selling about 125 of them, but then I still had this box of 75. And here we are in February, and I don't want to just put them in the recycling. And I thought, this morning I looked at this box, and I thought, I'm just going to bring them with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're over there. So please take one with you if you want one when you leave. Um, <laughs> OK. So tonight, so you may, real, you may have heard that I like to paint waves. And I do a lot of seascapes. But tonight, um, because we are in February, one of the other things that I really do enjoy painting a lot of is snow. I started painting snow probably, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And really, I started painting winter scenes purely because I was teaching. And what I was teaching these weekly classes, as Bobby mentioned, and we would change topics every month. And because my students were getting so good and we were, they were learning different things every month, I needed to come up with new things to teach. So in the wintertime, it made sense to be doing winter landscapes. So every winter, at some point, we would do winter landscape and we would do snow. And I'm very grateful that we, that we did that because it really made me fall in love with living in New England in a way that I had not before. 
Uh, <laughs> I did not grow up in New England. I grew up in Maryland. So I was not really used to or enamored with the weather here. And so really what happened when I started looking at the snow as an artist, it made me appreciate what I was seeing in a totally different way. Because, and I, maybe it has to do also with having painted so much water and so many waves. Automatically there was this affinity with painting the snow because you've got the white, the, the foam, and the snow. It was easy for me to see all the different colors once I really started looking for them. Because you, if I would assume most of you are artists, the more you look, the more you see. And there is really a lot of color in the winter landscape as soon as you start to look at it. And I think you have to maybe work a little bit harder to find the beauty sometimes this time of year, but it is there. And uh, snow in particular is very reflective J because you've got, it's really just little crystals of water and there's light bouncing off of them everywhere and color bouncing off of them. And as soon as you know to look for that, you can really see it. So. Uh, that, that to me is a huge inspiration in the wintertime and it really helps me get through the winter. And I have learned to love painting snow in, on sunny days and also on really cloudy snowy days. Like yesterday, for instance, uh, was not the nicest day, but I happened to be out driving around. My, my car was in the shop and I had to go pick it up. So I was driving home in the snow and in the slush and it was just, it, there's something about the atmosphere when the snow is swirling around and, and it, it was, I have done a series of paintings like that. So of course I pulled over and pulled out my camera and started clicking the camera all in. Because when you have a really, when the landscape is kind of drained of color like it was yesterday, but you've got all these different gradations of, you know, the, the pine trees that you can see kind of really clearly in the foreground and then as you move into the distance you can't see much of anything, you've got a real opportunity to convey depth in a different way that you can, than you can on a sunny day. And, and there's a different kind of atmosphere. And when there's no color, that's also an opportunity to create mood in a different way. So you can put any color in there you want. So it's a, it, and it's a chance to play with those, those less attractive colors in your box, those neutrals, and really play with the nuance of neutrals. So there's, I, I, I guess I tend to be an optimist. I look for, oh good, now I can play with the neutrals because there's no color in the landscape today. So, uh, so there's, there's always something beautiful to be found pretty much any day you go out there. Uh, so I have found a lot to love about the winter landscape. So what I'd like to do tonight is share with you basically what my process is. It's become, I've been painting in pastel for about uh, a little over 20 years. I used to, I've done, I started with watercolor um, and I painted in oil and I, I discovered pastel about 20 years ago when my uncle sent me a box of new pastels and I had been teaching a watercolor class and uh, when he sent me this box I kind of abandoned watercolor and just, I felt like I was cheating on my watercolor students because I really really a band. I just was only painting in pastels. I felt like it was just so much easier for me to, to just layer the color. I didn't have to stop and mix anything. Nothing had to dry. It was just so much easier. So before I get started, let me ask how many of you here paint or have painted in pastel before, have experience? Oh, that's great. So a whole, everybody's, a lot of people are really familiar. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of go through, explain my process. You can feel free to ask me questions along the way. I'm going to take a break at some point um, because I need to take a break and stand further back. And I find, especially during demos, that I don't do that. When I'm at home in my studio, I take plenty of breaks. My studio is in my house. So I find it really easy to walk away every 20 or 30 minutes and come back. And, uh, it's just kind of built in. I'm very easily distractible, so I will leave and come back pretty easily. But I find that harder, that that doesn't happen when I'm doing a demo, and then I'll stay at the, if I go for an hour and a half without stopping, and then I stand back, I think, oh, geez, what was I doing? You know, so I really need to take a break at some point for, for five minutes. And then at the end, I'll leave enough time for any, any remaining questions, if there are any. Um, okay, 
So let's get started. You'll see that I already have a drawing on here, so you don't have to watch me get the drawing on there, especially because this was kind of a complicated drawing, but I do want to share with you what I do to get started. Those of you who have taken my classes, because I notice a few people here already know this, but so this is this is how I start all the time. I'm gonna, I, I've got my iPad here. Uh, well, let me get it started. So you'll see, I, I've got, <clears throat> if you can see on here at the bottom, you, you're probably too far away to notice, but so you can see they're all in thumbnail form. And I, I organize my, my photos on my iPad into different folders based on subject matter. So I have a snow folder on here. Under waves, by the way, I have thousands of photos, but they're organized into different beaches, just so I can remember basically where I was when I took the different photos. But so I have this snow folder, and then when I, when I know I want to paint snow, uh, or even snowy trees, or whatever it is, I look into that folder. And then I just hit favorite for all the ones that, that I'm looking at and considering. So under favorites, this is what I've got right now. This is what I, the paintings I've been working on recently are in, are in this favorites, and then I'll just delete them after I'm done. So I've got these thumbnails here, but it's very convenient for me to be looking at them as thumbnails because uh, it's, they'll jump out at me with good design or not in a thumbnail. Because when it's small in a thumbnail, you can see what the, just, you can see the, shim, the simple shapes as opposed to seeing the subject matter. You're less likely to get distracted by little details or by the color, and you're just seeing the shape and the design. So that's the first thing I do is just look at all these thumbnails and figure out which ones really catch my eye. But that's just the first step. Second step is to then take a, a few of them and do thumbnail sketches. So I always do it on toned paper, and I use a black charcoal pencil and a white charcoal pencil, and I just do a basic little thumbnail sketch, and I keep them small, because if, if, I'm, if I were to use an entire sheet here, they, I would end up putting in too much detail. And this way, I can just see the simple design. The fun thing about this is I can tell by looking at these which ones get me excited to do a painting and which ones kind of fall flat. And it's not necessarily the same thing as when I'm looking at the photo. So it's, it's a different way of clarifying for myself what, what's a strong composition and what isn't. And I also write little notes on the sides. So next to the one that I chose for tonight, I wrote drama. Uh, what, it, what attracts me here is this splash of light on a diagonal behind the trees. I really think that that's cool. I did change, you probably can't see it on here. I adjusted it a little bit. <clears throat> this was just me walking down, walking in my neighborhood. There's a house back here. That's not going to be in the painting. Um, <clears throat> I also lifted the horizon a little bit in my sketch. So one, one thing I use this for is to alter the design, uh, nudge it in the direction I want to go in. And I added the trees were not arranged fortuitously, let's say. So I moved the trees around a little bit to a better composition here. So this, this step is really important for me. This one, oh, there's one over there that's, that I've got on here. I really, this, I wasn't sure if this would be a very interesting painting or not, but then when I did this, I thought, oh, I really like this. <clears throat> so often, this really is an inspiration for me and a, and a guide so that when I'm actually doing my painting, I can go back and look at this. Sometimes the painting falls a little flat and I can say, what happened? And I can go back to this and say, oh, I see. I have to make, this, make it more about this, this light right in here. I really have to push this light. It'll, it'll help me. It'll help just kind of redirect me in the right place. Thank you. OK, so for me, this is about the drama of this splash of light back here against these verticals. And I like the zigzag of all of the interplay of the shadows in the foreground. So there's, there's a number of things that attracted me to that. It's not to say I'm not going to paint some of those other ones that you saw there. I probably will paint a couple of those as well. Uh, there were a couple that I really liked. So for instance, I'll show you one other page on here. So this is three 
seascapes that I recently did sketches of, and all, all three of those I just painted right, one after the other because I just really liked all three sketches. So anyway, it's, I really like doing these. Th these give you, for me, they, they, they give a certain energy in the directions of the strokes in the sketch that you can't get either in the painting or in the photo. They, there's something in this sketch itself which is different from um, the other How long things. does it usually take you to do a sketch? To do a sketch? Ten minutes? If that. Okay. Five to ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. That really, they're very quick. It's, it's just... It's, yeah, I never spent... They're not very, they're not very long. Yeah. Okay. And then I try to keep it somewhere close by so I can keep referring to it while I'm working. Okay, so then I transfer my basic big shapes on here so that I'm ready to paint. So I've got my basic design. So my first step is underpainting. which I'm going to do a double underpainting for this, which I do in a lot of um, winter paintings. You'll see what I mean when I get started. What kind of paper are you using? This is UART paper. Uh, just from the feel of it, I, I think it's probably 400. This actually feels really smooth. It could even be 500. But it's probably 400. I have mostly 400. Um, and I, I use a lot of 320 also, but this is definitely not 320. It feels pretty smooth. And it's mounted onto, onto uh, foam core. I use either acid-free foam core or gator board. Okay. I have a dry mount press, but you can also, if you don't have a dry mount press, most people do not have a dry mount. I bought one from a framer a few years ago, but you can use 3M uh, positionable mounting adhesive. That's the best thing. It comes in a roll and it's really easy to use. All right. I like to mount my paper because then when I wet it during the underpainting process, it stays perfectly flat. All right. So for the underpainting, I like all the color and light that's back here. I'm looking to simplify what's going on back here. I'm going to put in my lightest colors first. There's yellows and oranges back there. I'm going to do the tree trunks on top of an initial layer so they're not going in first at all. I'm going to just draw over them. I actually sprayed this because I knew that when I did the underpainting, when I got this wet, if I didn't spray it, I would lose the tree trunks and I wanted to know where they were. So I, I actually sp I sprayed the underpainting with fixative so that the tree trunks would not disappear when I did the underpainting. So I want there to be a glow in some areas behind the trees, and it's glow and sense of light, orange and yellow are really good for that. Okay, and then we've got some darker trees. So instead of putting in greens right away for these trees, I'm going to use some uh, warmer complements to the greens. too dark. So I'm going to try to match the values that I see, but in a uh, complementary color. So there's a, so the, over here there's some cool dark greens. So what I'm doing is I'm going for a, a cool red, sort of a, a pinkish red for under those cool dark greens. And I'm just putting them in, in really big shapes right now, not little pine needles. just squinting because if I don't squint I won't see where the big shapes are. A little bit warmer through here. There 
there seems to be kind of a diagonal to the way that the, the branches, there's a gesture to these branches. When you're doing, doing trees, it's helpful to look at, often there's a gesture or there's a direction that the branches are growing in, and that's what I'm looking for right now. than I wanted, and I don't worry, I don't stress too much about putting in a wrong color. It's just gonna add a little bit, especially if it's the right value. It's not that big of a deal. So in the snow areas, where there's, there's this deep blue purple shadow, there's what I've noticed that I, that I like here, there's purple blue, but it's it's a different color. It's not the same everywhere. Right now, and that's all going to go in later. What I'm, I just want to get the value right now, and I can I can play around with pushing the color um, back and forth later. So the value is pretty similar throughout the shadow. It gets a little lighter in the foreground. I'm going to go a little bit warmer again. So this is not a warm color. It's it's purple, but it's warmer than the blue that's going to go on top of it. So My, the places that have to be light, I want to keep them light. So I think maybe I need to brush a little bit off right in here. This area is supposed to stay light. Yeah, that's supposed to be light right here. So I've got to push this blue up a little bit more. Some of these, the nice thing about pastel is it is opaque. So even though I've lost some of that bright light, I can just put it right back in over once I've finished with the underpainting. Needless to say, underpaintings look very abstract. <laughs> so the underpainting, you have to really turn off that little voice in your head that evaluates what it looks like until much later in the process. Because right now, I'm just setting up a, a base on which I'm going to be drawing and painting and putting many more layers. This is just, I'm just toning the paper. So I'm using, this is alcohol, 70% rub, rubbing alcohol. traveling, travel tip for any of you who travel paint, these little laundry caps work really well because they're sturdy and they don't crack and they bend. All right, I'm going to start with the lightest areas. This is actually a watercolor brush. Mm 
Uh oh. That that's not that's way darker than I wanted it to be. I probably should have tested that before putting it all on here. So what I'm going to do now is just lightly brush because I can change the value of this color just by the amount of pigment that's on the paper. Because that is not the right value when it gets. So most colors in pastel don't change value that much when you get them wet, but some of them do. And this apparently is one that does. And I've actually gotten pretty good at knowing which ones do and which ones don't, but this one surprised me. We'll see how that works. But let's finish up here first. I'm just going to get these. So up here, I'm, what I'm trying to do is mask some light and shadow. Get the, air, get the idea of sort of filtered light. All right, so I'm still not liking this color, but I think this is perfect. So actually, it's, it's not bad right in here where it needs to be a little darker. So what I might do is just not wet it down. There's no law that says it has to be wet. I might just rub it in with my fingers and keep it a, wet, a dry underpainting in those areas. I think I, I have a little piece of pipe insulation here. Okay, the first rule of um, pastel painting is don't panic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. Does anybody know how to do So the image up there is backwards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference if you still see what's going on. It's new technology, so. <laughs> they haven't worked out all the kinks yet. So this, by the way, if you don't want to rip up your fingers, this is just a little piece of piping insulation, and it's really good for pushing. For an underpainting, this really does count as a, as a dry underpainting. What I'm doing is just pushing the pastel into the paper, and I'm going to be putting more colors on top, and this, this just makes it um, harder for those colors to mix together. It'll just sit in the paper a little bit better. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm doing this. I can still see my trees through here, which is, which is helpful. So before I get to doing the trees, uh, I, do, I do need to do a little bit of redrawing because I want to be sure I know where, this, where my streak of light is back there. And I lost that completely. So I, I just want to, and I actually need to redraw a couple of these trees. So let me just uh, reestablish that drawing real quickly here. Easy to, re to establish the drawing because I can still see these.
This is just a piece of uh, charcoal, General's charcoal. to draw that with white. That's this is the the white line. So now I have a fairly good sense of where things are going. I can add in a little bit more of this purple in here. I'm just going to add in some white so that's clear to me too. do this more carefully but I just need the, the graphic sense of where where this is for now. Part of the underpainting that I was saying that that's really helpful for me when I'm doing a, a, a winter scene is to put the trunks in and then wet those down as well. 
So uh, it's just it's just helpful because they then because if you look at the trunks, I don't know if you can see this or not, but they're, they're all different colors, and there's whoops. Then there's there's things there's things that cross over them, and there's overlapping. And if if I just establish those dark values and then put things on top of them, it's it's just that then they're not going to be smudging all over the place. It's just because when you have winter scenes, often you have these darks, uh, the dark starkness of the winter of the dark trees, and then there's lights right up next to them. So if you just kind of lock in those dark, uh, sharp lines, then you can. It's just easier to to deal with all the uh, the lights right up next to them and contrasts and layering other colors. But trying to get them all in in the same underpainting is really challenging. So just doing a second underpainting seems to work well. Mm. Trying to decide what color to use. I think I'm, I'm going to use a combination of both a warm brown and a purple for these. Just so they're not too uniform. And I don't care if these go much darker, that's fine. The nice thing about doing this too is then you don't, they don't look as drawn on. They look, you get them to be a little bit more organic looking, you can wiggle the brush. Throw in a couple branches. <coughs> oh, should have used a different brush for that. So you may wonder why this is, if this is a winter painting, why am I doing it all in pinks and oranges and purples? It's very warm looking. Well, it is sunny, right? This is a sunny day, and I want that sense of warmth. The blues are going to go on top. I feel like when you have a, a winter scene, especially, if you can get as much warmth into it as possible, it's going to make it more visually appealing. And it's going to wake up the scene, and, and uh, it just, you're going to get more of the sense of sunlight the more warmth you can get into the scene. So I typically always add oranges and yellows behind greens. So I was specifically looking for a scene that had greens, particularly greens with sunlight behind it. If you have sunlight behind greens, you are going to have oranges and yellows there. There's, there's going to be, well here, especially because you've got some oak leaves hanging on there. So there are oranges, but even over here where there's just greens, 
there's always going to be little bits of branches or there's going to be warmth. Look at that, look at that kind of golden color on those pine needles. There's a, there's a certain warmth to, to the greens. So putting this yellow, look at what a beautiful combination that, that purple and the yellow are together. Uh, I like to push the color a little bit in a direction that's going to be visually appealing. But those colors really are there. There are oranges underneath the grass all the time. There's the reason there's all these blues are in the shadows on a sunny day is because they're reflecting the blue of the sky. And they're, look at how they're a different color blue underneath the trees than they are here. You see how different that is? So you don't want it to be the same color blue everywhere either. Uh, the other thing is you can't even trust what you're seeing here because the colors in person, especially on a snowy day, are going to be very different. Often the whites are really whited out, the shadows are too dark, there's too much glare, the contrasts are too much, so you, you need to put more color in and, and take out some of the contrast. The best thing to do is actually try to get out and paint outside, or at least take color notes. Even if you just sit in your car and make little notes of what the, the colors are, so that you have those as references when you're painting from photos in your studio. Really makes a big difference. It's the whites, it's so hard to see the accurate color of the whites of the snow from a photograph. The photos just blank them all out and they tend to make everything look bluer than it is. So d don't assume that what you're looking at in a photo is accurate. The, the good thing about that is that you don't have to feel like you have to take whatever's in the photo as, um, as gospel. You can take license with it. Okay. So it's already getting a sense of light. All right, I think I may try, see if this will, just to solidify this. Nah, not going to bother with that. Okay. So generally I like, so I've got my underpainting done. Generally I like to work from the back forwards uh, or from the end from the top down. So I'm going to start developing the, basically the background behind these trees a little bit more. And trees are just, these trees in the, I can tell you with that one, see this one over here? I wrestled back and forth with these trees for a long time because it was really tough to, I put in the detail, took it out, put it in, took it out. So it's, it, is, it is difficult to play around with, with this kind of stuff back here. But, so you wanna, put in, you wanna put in as little detail as possible to imply detail being there without giving too much information. That's my goal, is to give a little bit but let the brain just kind of fill in the rest. So now that I've got that warmth, ooh, I don't want to, I just put these, so these are my pastels that, that you can order, and I just wanted to show you what they look like, but I'm afraid I'm going to grab them and use them, so I'm going to just move them over here. That dark green is really perfect. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to grab this one. There is a hint of blue. I'm just going to put a little bit of blue in the sky to kind of set the, because the, the blue, if there were no blue up here, it wouldn't make sense to have all that blue down there. So I want to just put a little bit of this blue up in here. I think it might have to be a little bit lighter value. of it's peeking through. There's some of it over here. Can 
since there's no house there, there would be more blue. There's going to be a little more blue. Okay, so let's put in some of these branches. I'm actually going to just give myself a little of the armature of the branches. There's a branch coming across. Sometimes I put in branches first, and sometimes I put them in afterwards. It, I, if you put too many in right away, then they tend to take over. So often I just like to put in the big clumps first. I do like to leave a lot of the red showing. Actually, that has to be blue before I go over it, so let's adjust this to be blue. So this blue that I'm putting over it right now, I'm, I'm letting some of the purple show through. Yeah, that's nice, that blue. There's just something really nice about blue against that clean white. I guess that's why I like painting waves. <laughs> it just reminds me of the water. So the white that I'm using here has a touch of yellow in it because it's reflecting the sunlight. And I can make it, you know, I can push it even a little bit more in this area, look, and I'm going to make it even a little more yellow. You see that? And I'll vary it around the painting so it won't be this too consistent. But back here, where it's really at where I want the most impact, I'm going to use this sort of yellow white, and I'll probably just leave right there, I'll leave that a little more purple. So a scene like this, definitely more complex than a wave. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the wave, I guess. Notice I've, I've, I've 
abandoned the trees. I've got to go back to those trees. <laughs> Let's find, a, find the right green. It's always a problem, isn't it, finding the right green? So what I'm doing now is looking, looking for a, a green for over in this section where the, the colors are not as dark as those. Uh, I want something that's going to go well with, the, with this orange. It's going to be basically the same, the right uh, value for the orange. Most of these are behind these, these trees. So I start by working in one color, and then I then I um, modify it. But the simpler I keep it, the better at first. Much harder pastel, like making that noise. Okay, I want a sense of there being a lot of this, you know, really a lot of leaf coverage in here. This is sort of an additive slash subtractive kind of thing. I'm, I'm going to be going back and forth into and out of this area. The, the trick with doing this without having it just turn into a big mess is to make sure that I keep my dark areas kind of connected to each other and not to break up the dark and light too much so it gets too spotty. I don't want it to look like chocolate chip cookies with lots of little spots. If I put too many spots of too many small spots of light in a dark area or vice versa, it starts to fall apart. So I have to keep my darks connected, keep my lights connected. That's kind of a big uh, tip there. So the first thing I'm doing is just looking for what are the big masses. This is a kind of a big area that's kind of all dark in here. Once you have your big masses defined, then you go back in and create a few details. If you start doing details too early, it falls apart. hard to understand and I think there must just I don't know what that is back there no there's there is sky back there there's more buildings
Okay, so let's put in some of this bright snow. I'm going to have to, you know, restate these trunks, of course. We need the bright snow in there. So this, this is kind of a focal area. I really like this little zigzag of snow right in here, which is why I'm making sure it stays sharp. You really want to figure out, pick and choose which sharp edges you keep. There's going to be a lot more sharp edges in a photo. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of inadvertently talking about painting from photos doing this, because obviously we're painting from a photo here. If you're painting outside, you're making different kinds of choices. But painting from photos, you're always having to make and orchestrate your choices about what you are making your painting about. Because the camera doesn't make those choices. It just keeps everything important, makes everything focus. But if you do that, you're, there's going to be the detail in, the, in your painting is going to be overwhelming. And it's tempting to be to do that. <laughs> And whichever part of the painting you're working on is tempting to make that part in full focus. So it's, it's really helpful to, to clarify for yourself what it is that you're trying to get across in your painting. And then you, it's clearer what you can let go. compare it to being a parent. So it's much more difficult not to say something than to say it, but it's also more effective. <laughs> so you're seeing, noticing I'm actually using my fingers I, this is a nice tool to use sometimes. The side, of the very side edge of my pinky, I use to soften an edge. Sometimes, I don't just blend with my fingers this way very often, unless I'm doing a sky. Because sometimes I find the skies I tend to need to have really soft edges more often. But um, I, I do find this is a good tool if you're using it for a specific purpose. I don't always use my fingers to blend because often it will dull the colors down. So I prefer to just layer without using my fingers. But in certain spots, it's really, really helpful to give a nice finish or a nice edge. I'm starting with just this one color blue. I'm going to go back in and add um, a little more interest to those to that color.
This part is sort of like puzzle pieces. It's like there's no no good way to do it. One thing, I guess one thing I could do is go, this might be, I think this might make sense. Show you what I'm gonna do. I think this will this will be better. I'm gonna go ahead and paint this this spot, this area here. I'm gonna go back in and lift it, lift out the trunks. Because I have to paint over the trunks anyway. Because I, I really hate painting up to the line. All right, so I'll show you what I'm talking about. I really do like um, dry brushes for just about everything. I have lots of different ones that I carry around with me. I'm gonna use a fan brush for this because it's skinny and I, I can control it really well. But I'm just gonna go in and Probably the biggest thing that has changed, a couple things have changed in the last couple years in my work. One is that I'm much more careful with my underpaintings. The other is that I use these brushes to brush stuff off as a part of the process and sometimes I just leave, I leave things brushed off. I like the soft edges that a brush will use, but I use brushes as a tool um, a lot and a lot more than I ever used to. I used to think, well, you know, if you take, if you're using a brush, it's because you made a mistake and you have to lift something off. But now, and then I realize it's actually a really nice. It, it gives you some really nice effects. So why not just consider it as a tool? Yeah. So then now that feels more like a um, continuous bit of sunshine behind there and that works better than it does right here where I just tried to go around it. So let's see if I can erase into that a little bit more. There. Okay. So let's see if we can get the foreground filled in just a little bit more. How are we going to do this? I'm going to look back at my... So one thing I, I kind of tried to make a little, oh, I just messed it up, but I tried to get a little bit of a zigzag going. I like these sort of zigzags going up this way. Whenever you see, this is very similar to the foam in, in a wave painting, where you have to sort of decide that you're going to create a composition, or you're going because you have to make some sort of sense out of the crazy shadow patterns. And you can help it to, to you can make it work for your composition. So I decided I'm going to have these, I'm going to, choose these patterns that are leading up this direction, I'm going to emphasize those a little bit to lead you into the composition this way, to make these the primary trees right here. So uh, we're just going to, let's see, I think it was this one. There's no soft edge, there's no hard edges there at all. So what I'm doing is building to gradually lighter colors. I 
again, not stressing too much, not being too careful. Because if you're too careful, it's going to be clear that you were really careful with the way you put it on. You want it to look, this is not, these are just wild patterns. They're wild and soft. And, and if, you're, if you're really painstaking about putting it on there, it's going to look painstaking and, and it's not going to give you the feeling that you want. Okay, I'm going to use my little uh, blender again here just to soften some of this pigment out. Again, this, is, this area down here is not a focal point. I don't have to make everything really perfect. Some of it can, be, can stay kind of loose. And notice I'm blending in the direction that I want the eye and the, the, the composition to move. So now we're going to go for a lighter color. Same thing as up here. I don't want it to feel too broken up. I want to give the sense of light streaks coming across. So I'm trying to get, get, make sure the shapes are kind of creating that sense of light patterns falling in certain direction but not, not too broken up. So not as many on here. The rule for dappled light is put, as, put a third as many as you see if you're gonna, if, you, if you're the uh, mathematical kind of person who needs proportions, one to three. I prefer to eyeball it. You don't. You want to avoid too many that are, that are the same. So that's kind of what I'm looking for here. And I want to. Now I'm going to try to look. For, put in some brighter colors. So, so there's like a little hill going across here that I don't have on there yet. feel myself getting to that time where I'm going to have to step back from this in a minute. But I'm not quite ready because I, I just want to, I'm, I'm I don't like the trees enough to step back yet, so um, just give me, give me a second here to play with these trees. I'm going to gray them up a little bit. I'm only going to, I'm going to take about a five minute break step back and get some water and then keep going until 8.30 and then um, answer any questions, any further questions. Trees, I mean, when I, when I do a, a demo on a wave, I can pretty much finish the wave in, in the time. Um, this is not going to be finished, finished because the trees take a little bit longer to, to get to where I really like them. But what I will do is um, 
if you came to any of you who I, I was here for Michelle Jung's oil painting demo and if you if you were were here for that she posted on Instagram and um, maybe Facebook too I'm not sure she posted periodic updates that as she kept finishing her painting until it was finished and um, and I post on Instagram all the time and it automatically posts to my pastel page or to my Facebook page too so I will definitely you know when I will finish this to whatever certainly not be not complete not going to be complete by the end of the evening and I will post an update there oops sorry that's my daughter <laughs> I told her I was doing a demo tonight so she <laughs> I know she doesn't really listen to what I'm saying. I, you know. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to take a quick break. And um, I think I let me just smooth this out. Just take a quick five minute break and then uh, get back to it. Also, if anybody's interested, like I, th I think somebody said, you could come up and do my sign my newsletter or sign up for my newsletter if you're interested. Good time today. And don't forget to get a calendar.